chapter six for part two of this message this week. And I gotta say, just uh, just a funny and and a and an honor about my dad. Uh, there's there's two things that that my dad has always said to me. <clears throat> On a silly note, if I didn't quite get things done the way he wanted me to get it done, he his one-liner was always, "Do you need a Q-tip?" <laughs> And that, that meant I obviously had not listened to him and my ears were clogged up. And so, you know, I, I like to use that line myself <laughs> as a dad to my kids. Uh, but then uh, there's another thing that my dad uh, used to say to me, and uh, uh, I always appreciated it. I, you know, he was raised in a generation uh, of men or around a generation of men uh, that wasn't so verbal. You know what I mean? If you know the older school of generation, and a few of you here know what I'm talking about, this younger generation has no clue. <laughs> but um, the old school generation said very little fathers to their kids. And, and uh, my dad was, was raised in that generation. And so uh, he always thought it very important um, to say to me, son, I love you, because it was hard for his generation. And so I always appreciate so much. I, I could so, say so many one-liners from my dad, and I won't, uh, I won't do that to you this morning, but uh, what a man. When I think of my dad, though, I think of a, I think of a warrior. I really do, because uh, as a spiritual man, he knows how to fight. And so today we're going to look at part two. Uh, I titled it, In the Fight of Our Lives. Uh, but today I kind of want to tweak that sermon title for today and say, what does it mean to fight like a man? So let's read this passage again together. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 and through verse 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of of God that you may be able to stand against the scheming of the enemy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, rulers and, and against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so therefore take up the whole armor uh, of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand firm. Stand, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end, to that end rather, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints." Let's pray. Father, today we're just thankful that we can be in your house. And Lord, we know that as believers, we really are in a fight. And I pray, God, today as we look at the second part of this message and the passage, that, God, you would challenge us to be fervent in our walks with you. Because, Lord, as sure as, sure as we're not, the enemy will come along to distract us and discourage us uh, from what you would have us to be about. Lord, I pray for all of us men here today as leaders of our homes, God. It's so important uh, that we model both walking with you and, and fighting for you. I pray that you would help us to be the men you've called us to be. As this passage says, be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. That's what you've called men to do. 
And I pray, God, that you would be honored in this time in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said amen and amen. Well, this has been a three-part, this is a three-point sermon. And last week, uh, we covered point one, okay? And, and that simply, just for, for a review, for those of you that may have not been in here or you weren't here last week, uh, just a quick recap. So we're in the fight of our lives, spiritual warfare. Hey, if you don't believe in spiritual warfare and you are a believer, guess what? You're going to find out real quick that that's, it's real. <laughs> and you're going to begin to experience things that uh, when you are entangled in ministry and wanting to do things for Christ in his kingdom, you're going to find out fast that it really is a war. And so the first point that I shared last week was the fight is spiritual. And we looked at verse 12 we don't battle against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual warfare. We said two things about uh, this, this battle. First of all, we talked about the organization of our enemy. And we looked carefully at verse 12 and the four designations there of the demonic ranks that uh, Paul highlighted under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Principalities, or that is uh, demonic authority. We looked at powers, or that is, those demons who have the influence uh, to oppress mankind. We looked at, at rulers of darkness, so that is, uh, the activity of demons to keep people blinded to their need of Christ. And then we looked third, uh, fourth rather, at spiritual wickedness. Literally, within Christianity, how there are people who pose as believers, pose as ministers of light, but really they are deceived themselves and they're working against the kingdom. Wow. And then secondly, we not only looked at the organization of the enemy, but we looked at the operations of the enemy. What is he capable of doing with all of these ranks that he has? Well, we said, number one, the enemy looks for people who are not prepared. We said, number two, the enemy will use your emotions against you. Number three, the enemy will attack you at certain places. We said four, the enemy will call to question God's loyalty to you. And then finally, we said the enemy will attack your mind. Well, we're going to pick up there today. And let me recap and, uh, this one thought. It's very clear. When, when you are in the spiritual battle of life and for the kingdom of Christ, there's three types of people. There are people who will fight. And they will be involved in the kingdom of God and fight for the kingdom until they take their last breath. But then there are going to be those who fail. There are going to be those who enter the arena. And here's some things we're going to talk about today. They're going to be discouraged and distracted. They're going to get drained and they are going to fail in the battle because they tried to do it in the power of the flesh. And when they fail, <laughs> it will both hurt their, their own lives, the kingdom of Christ, and it will defame uh, the church of God. It happens a lot, quite frankly. And so which one will you be? Will you be the one that will fight or the one that will fail? And then some, as the scripture, is, we won't recap completely last week or re-preach completely what we said last week. There'll be some in the midst of the fight who will be identified not as a soldier of the king, but as a soldier of the enemy. And their true colors will come out because they'll wave a flag differently at the end of the fight than they said they would wave at the beginning and those are those who fall out of the ranks and, and it becomes very obvious that they are not on the Lord's side. Those are the painful ones to discover. Even the Lord, we said last week, had Judas in his midst and he fell out of the wayside and into the devil's trap. Well, here's two things, so the second and third part of this message today. So we first said the fight is spiritual. Well, point number two in the message... In verse 11 and 13, if you'll look at that, is his objective is surrender. Everybody say surrender. Man, he wants you to wave the white flag of surrender. 
Uh, in verse uh, 11 and 13, you look at the implications of these two statements. He says to put on, he admonishes us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil, that you may be able to stand, Paul said later in verse 13, in the evil day. You notice again, he doesn't say that this day might come. He's talking to them about in present tense. Uh, this is an evil day. This is something you're going to endure all the time. And so, hey, uh, what, why does he say this? Why does he tell us to put on the whole armor of God? Because if we are not prepared to fight, what happens when an army comes against you who is prepared to fight and you uh, don't have your weapons ready? Well, you're, you're forced to what? You're forced to surrender because you're not ready. And so Paul not admonishes us to be ready to fight and he admonishes us to be ready to fight because the devil as soon as we become a believer, his objective is to get us to surrender the fight. His objective is to get us to fail in the fight because that's, that's what the, the enemy is good about doing. All right? So uh, he wants us to lay down our armor. He wants us to lay down our weapons. He wants us to walk away from the battlefield. How many times in, in, in if you've been around... Uh, any length of time, a ministry or, or, or the church or just walking with the Lord. How many times in your life have you seen someone surrender and walk away from the battle? I've recently been talking to some, some people like that. People that I used to watch very engulfed in the battle, very involved but for various reasons, they have surrendered in the fight. Well, here it is, Father's Day. And if you look at this passage, Paul is really saying to men, hey, real men don't surrender. Uh, all throughout this, uh, this is addressed to all believers, of course. But yet, if you put this in context, Daniel, this is on the, the foothills of addressing the family, right? Chapter 5, he he, he said to men, hey, husbands, you're to love your wives. And, and he, he then gets into chapter 6 and he says, hey, uh, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. And, and in context, he is, he is admonishing men to be who God designed them to be. And then he turns to their spiritual warfare. Hey, I want to tell you something. Watch this, guys. If, if you ever really want to, to serve the Lord, and you have a family, you are definitely in the line of the enemy. And so, hey, we better hear the entire context of, of admonition. I know I'm going back all the way two to three weeks ago where I was at in, in, this, in, in this book. But we better hear the entire admonition. Love your wives. Lead your children and go to battle for the kingdom. That's the entire context of this message. We're to be real men. Who, who lead our families, who love our wives, and who take it to the enemy with the Lord's weapons. And so, hey, uh, we better hear that today as, as fathers. Uh, I love verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, you men, some versions say, be strong in the Lord. That's a twin verse. Paul says this throughout of his, all of his writings. In fact, right by verse 10, you can write down 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It's a twin verse where at the close of that passage of that book, he says, watch you, stand fast in the faith. And he says, I like this, Mike. He says, act like men. Be strong. Why does Paul give us so many admonitions like this? Because Paul knows that in a spiritual fight that people are are provoked and, 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 and given the opportunity to surrender. In fact, there are several other verses. Let me give you some other verses. All throughout the Bible where Paul writes, where, where he's dealing with not surrendering, not quitting. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul says, Therefore, uh, you brethren, be steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says, fight the fight. Remember that one? Finish your course. Don't quit. Don't surrender. And he says, let us not be weary in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, of well-doing. Why? Because in due season, we shall reap if we do not faint. There's all kinds of admonitions all through Paul's writings in Scripture. And hey, if you believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, here's one, uh, another one for you. Hebrews 12, 12, I love this. He says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Not only does he admonish us not to quit, but he admonishes us, Jason, to look around us as men, as soldiers on the battlefield to identify other soldiers who might be ready to quit. And he says, hey, look around you. Find the one that's weak. Find the one that's about to fall by the wayside and encourage them and help them and lift them up. There's all kinds of admonitions in, in the New Testament about not quitting, not surrendering over and over again. Take your stand. Stand against the devil. Stand in the evil day and never quit. You know, but a lot of people quit today. I want to share four reasons what in the last few years of my ministry that I've seen why people quit. You ready? You better listen. Listen. One of the number one reasons why people quit in their walk with Christ and, and being involved in a church is this. You ready? They're disappointed with other Christians. They are. You see, when you're walking with the Lord, you're supposed to what? You're supposed to keep your eyes on who? On Christ. That's right, on Him. Uh, Hebrews says that He's the author and the finisher of our faith. We're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But the problem is sometimes in the battle, in the fight, in this spiritual warfare... We, we're giving it our all, and then all of a sudden you look at somebody to your right or to your left, and they're not doing what they're called to do. And then you start getting disappointed with them. And you get your eyes on them. And that's one of the number one reasons people uh, start surrendering in the battle. But watch this. Let me give you a good example of, uh, of what we need to learn from that. Over in the book of John, the latter part, John chapter 21 to be exact. You remember when Jesus was telling Peter and the other apostles by the fire there when he had cooked the fish for them and he had entreated their hearts and, and, and Sean, he, he looks at Simon Peter and he says, Simon, you follow me. Remember that? And Simon hears that admonition to, to follow him. And then he looks at John and what did he say? He said, Lord, what would you have this man to do? Yep. Talking about John. And this is what Jesus said. You know, Peter was a spastic Labrador retriever, you know. And, and it, you know that. And Jesus said, hey, hey, you, you follow me. You don't keep your eye. Don't think about what John is going to do. Whatever I tell John to do, that's what he's going to do. But you follow me. Keep your eyes on me. And one of the number one reasons people surrender in the battle or in the spiritual warfare of life is they get their eyes off of Christ and they put it on other people. But then another thing why people uh, quit in the battle, not only do they get disappointed, but they get discouraged. They just get discouraged. Oh, lots of people get down and out. They get bummed out. They want to quit because it doesn't seem like things are going the way they should go. Maybe they're saying, God's not answering all the prayers that I expected him to answer. Uh, nothing's happening uh, right at the church the way it should be. Uh, you know, it's the same old, same old. It's, it's unending. It's, it's useless. It's unappreciated. You know, hey, I, I just can't see what God is doing right now. And instead of 
being in the Word or instead of, of praying and, and looking through the Scriptures for an answer, they look to what? We're going to talk about it in just a moment. They look to their emotions and how they feel about things and they become discouraged in heart. They may be disappointed with other people. They might be discouraged in their heart. Man, I've... I can't tell you how many times I've, got, I've had pastor friends call me on Monday or Tuesday. Or they text me, you know. And they've been through a series of, of two or three weekends in a row where everything at church went horribly. And they're just discouraged because things aren't happening the way they feel they ought to happen. I had a youth pastor that's going to be at camp this week text me Thursday, and he said, camp couldn't have come at a better time. I am so discouraged. Wow. And so I called him, and I prayed for him, prayed with him. And I said, hey, you know what? You got to keep, I'm preaching on this, this Sunday. You got to keep your eyes and your heart Focused on Christ. But then there's another reason people surrender the battle. Not only do they get uh, uh, disappointed with other people, discouraged, but they get distracted from the world. Man, that's one of the devil's chief tools. Man, people are involved in, in spiritual warfare, and along comes the devil to tempt them in just the right way at their weakest point. You know, we all have weak points, right? We do. We all have weak points, and through trial and... Hey, the devil's not omniscient, amen? Praise the Lord for that. But through trial and error, uh, the devil and his forces of evil, these demonic ranks that we talked about last week, through trial and error, they find our weak points, and they know right where to attack where the flank is not secured. And so, oh, there's, there's a distraction from the world. I think of Paul when he told Timothy. T Paul had a team of men with him all the time. And I think of Paul when he told Timothy uh, right into, at the end of 2 Timothy, and it was chapter 4, and I believe it was either verse 9 or verse 10. Uh, hey, to Paul told Timothy, For Demaeus has left me, for he has loved this present world. Wow. What did Paul mean by that? Now, he made it personal because Paul was, was in a team, a ministry team with this guy and had been on plenty of missionary trips with him and had, had been in the battle with him. And suddenly, this man, Demaeus, got his eyes on worldly things and decided that he was going to leave the ministry, leave the battle, and get attracted and get involved into the things of the world. It was saddening to the heart of the Apostle Paul. And that's why he said, He has left me and he has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You look around and, hey, I've watched it several times. It, it troubles my heart when you get people who are involved in ministry, going full throttle in, in ministry, and then two or three years later, you can't even find them because they have fell into the sin of the world. And watch this. They're too ashamed to even come back and darken the church door. So, man, it's the tool of, of the enemy. I'm going to tell you something else that happens to people and causes them to quit and lay off the battle. It's just from being drained and tired. You ever been tired? You ever been just wore out? Yeah. Man, hey, in the middle of fighting for the cause of Christ, sometimes when you divert from the weapons that are strong and you start operating in the power of the flesh, guess what's happening? You get tired. You get drained. And you can't go on. We're going to talk about all of these things, but I, I think I have always with humor uh, thought about this, this thought with this passage. In, in Psalm 55 verse 6, David said this, 
He said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. What did he say? Then I would fly away and be at rest. What was David saying? He had literally been in, the, in so many fights, in so many battles, he thought to himself and he wrote to God, if I could just find a remote island in the middle of nowhere, I would just go there. You ever felt that way? I would go there. Man, when you have that kind of mentality, your heart isn't in, 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 in the right place. Now, I'm not saying that you're unspiritual. I'm saying that you have diverted to the power of the flesh, and the flesh can never win. The flesh will always fail. It will grow tired and say, I want to quit. God, I can't handle this anymore. Amen? And so we've got to return back to the source of our power. Uh, I, I've said this before in, in different times, different places. But, man, when I think about being drained, I think about that poor woman. And you, you young people, y'all won't even know what I'm talking about when I talk about this commercial. But y'all remember that old product called Calgon? Y'all remember that? How many of y'all remember? Let's see how, how many old people are in here. All right, okay. I saw the hand go back down over here. As soon as I said old people, Natalie put her hand back down. <laughs> No, but when we, hey, when I was little, there was this commercial, this Calgon commercial. And there was this woman in the middle of her living room. And Christy, her baby was screaming. The dog was barking and chasing the cat through the living room. She had one of those boiling pots on the stove, and it was, it was whistling. The phone was ringing. The doorbell was ringing. I mean, everything was going on. This kid comes up and screams and says, The toilet is clogged! The toilet is clogged! And she grabs her hair, and she goes, Oh, cow God, take me away! And the next thing you know, you see her in this bubbly tub with foam up to her face, and she's going, ah. Hey, let's face it. We are in a spiritual battle. And sometimes the dog is barking and chasing the cat, and the pot is whistling, the doorbell's ringing, the phone is ringing, the, the toilet is clogged. Everything has gone to hell in a handbasket. You, you understand what I'm saying? And you just think, if I could just get away from this place for just 10 days and talk to nobody, I'm going to take my cell phone and shoot it. <laughs> You're tired. Listen, folks, listen to my heart. That's what happens in the middle of the battle. You get disappointed with people. You say, have you gotten off subject? No. Because remember, we talked about all the ways that the enemy knows when to attack. You get tired. You, hey, you get distracted. You get discouraged. You get disappointed. And you get drained. I'm going to tell you what. I've experienced every one of those. And I've experienced every one of those to its height. You hear me? Well, what do we need to do? Men, hey, I want to tell you, the number one problem with men are all of those things right there, but, but we are so fatigued in life. I'm not saying that women are not. It's Father's Day. Don't get offended, uh, Mama. But men, hey, they got a lot of pressure at work. They got a lot of pressure at home. They got a lot of things going on in their own life and world. And hey, let's just be honest. Sometimes we men, we have a lot of hopes and dreams in life and we envision how things ought to be. And all of a sudden, when you've got three rug rats running around, you've got a wife, you've got job stress, responsibilities, and all of a sudden you're 35 and you can't handle it anymore. And you look for an outlet. And the devil offers them all the time. You've got to be careful. Got to be careful. In this last year, I've seen a lot of people take some outlets that they should have never even considered. Well, 
Now I've gone to meddle and quit preaching. Well, so the, the fight is spiritual. The battle is all about surrender. But the third point is this. Our weapons are strong. Everybody say strong. Man, when we talk about daddies, they are the strongest men on earth, right? Man, I'll never forget. I've got to tell something on my dad. My daddy is, he's about five foot six and a half. He's a little bitty scrappy thing. I'll never forget when I was about seven years old. He was, I don't know, about my age, 42 or so. And he, he had all kinds of teenagers that he was ministering to as a pastor of the church. They, we didn't have a youth pastor. But we didn't even know what that was back in those days. But, but he was running the youth group, and he had some boys that played football and different things in the church. And I'll never forget old Benny Waldrup. He literally, literally, I'm not kidding you, there's some guys that have such testosterone flowing through their body that they literally like to go around and go, mm, you know, mm, I mean, publicly. Before church, Benny would get up on stage because he knew people were looking, he'd go, mm, mm, you know. And my dad was like really getting irritated at Benny. And so dad walked up to the beginning, uh, to the front of the church right before service one Sunday, and Benny was up there and he said, hey, come here. And Benny walked down and he said, what are you doing on the stage? He said, I just want everybody to know I am the man. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sitting there taking that in as a six, seven-year-old, and I'm thinking, you an ugly man, you know. <laughs> Woo, God bless you. And my daddy said this. This boy was scrapping. I mean, he was scra scrappy. Scruffy, too. And this is what my dad said. He said, after church, I'm going to take this coat and tie off, and we're going to go out there and put our arms over the front of that Buick out front, and you and I are going to arm wrestle. And if I win, you are never going to get on this stage for church on Sunday morning and flex those muscles ever again. And if I lose, then you can honey and feather me in front of the entire church. And I'm sitting there going, uh, have you seen him? Have you really? And I was thinking, oh, Dad is about to be embarrassed. Everybody heard the, the gauntlet. I mean, it's like, you know, throwing down the gauntlet. Everybody heard it. It was an ultimatum. And long story short, everybody hung around after church that day. Wasn't nobody going home to get roast that quick. Dad ripped his tie off. He took his coat off. He laid down on the front end of that Buick, and there come Benny, and Benny was like, Hey, guys, watch this. I'm going to embarrass the preacher. I'm going to tell you, before that boy could even think, boom, he had laid him out, and Benny said, Oh, I wasn't ready. <laughs> I wasn't ready. Dad said, I'll give you all the time you need. He said, because you see, where I grew up, I, I threw hay bales. And he said, I picked cotton and beans and corn. And he said, we dug taters by hand. He said, and you just flex a few barbells this week. He said, I've got more muscles than you ever thought about having, son. So take all the time you need. And everybody was like, ooh. <laughs> And boy, they laid out there again. Dad said, I, I, I beat you fair and square, but we'll do it again. And then, boom, they locked up. And Dad played with him a little bit. And then, boom, and put him down again. And Dad stood up and he said, never again will Benny Waldrop get on our stage and flex his muscles. <laughs> you know what? I walked away that day thinking, you know, I, I thought, my dad is the man. He beat a football player arm wrestling. <laughs> and later on, Dad said, man, I was scared that boy was going to beat me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord. Man, we got to be men sometimes. Guys, the devil comes up on the, on the stage of life and goes, mm. That kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> he flexes their, our, their muscles uh, at us. The enemy says, hey, I got this stage. You ain't nothing, punk. 
And we're either going to shrink away from that battle or we're going to say, you know what? If I use the weapons that are in my arsenal, this enemy will go down and be humiliated. Amen. But not of my accord, by his power. So what are the weapons? And, and you've got the message. You ready for this? Uh, here are the weapons. First of all, in verse 14, we talked about last week, and I, 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 boy, I really worked hard to alliterate this, so y'all should pay attention. All right. First, it's the belt. <laughs> Uh, the, the belt, what is it? Well, the Bible says, gird up your loins, right? We talked about la that last week, so I won't, I, won't, uh, I won't rehash all of that. But you know what? The devil, what we said last week, is always ready to attack the people who are not ready. So that first, that first one is the belt. The belt. It, it's readiness. Everybody say Readiness. Boy, you've got to be ready every day of the battle. And I hate to say it like this, but you can never take a day off because the devil never takes a day off. So the belt, the belt is all about readiness. Everybody say that. The belt is all about readiness. So you better be ready for battle every day. And what does that mean? That means that every day, we talked about the Spirit-filled life three weeks ago, that means that every day you better be under the control of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that, friends, is the way, if I can digress to that complete message in this moment, just insert it right there. It, 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 that's the way you're ready every day. You're not coming in the power of the flesh, you're coming in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every day you're taking the bottom of, of the hem of that tunic and you're tucking it in the belt and you're saying I'm ready the belt but then secondly there's the breastplate now the, the breastplate the belt is all about readiness but watch this the breastplate is all about righteousness and it's called the breastplate of righteousness right you remember we talked about the breastplate. The Roman soldier had a breastplate. Boy, wouldn't you want your chest, guys, to look like that Roman soldier's breastplate? You know, big pectoral muscles, ripped abs, intimidating, you know. But it protect the splagna. That's the Greekans of, of the body. But you know what? In the, in the realm of Christianity, it's not about the organs of the body. It's all about the emotions. Watch this. Tank, we're either going to be in control, we're going to be controlled by our emotions, or we're going to be controlled by the righteousness of Christ in our life. And so not only do we need to be ready, but we need to turn to the righteousness within. Within. You see the picture there that Paul paints? The splagna, the, the, the organs are within. Well, guess who lives within us? Christ lives in us. And what is the source of our victory? It's Christ. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we have the belt. Oh, we're ready. We have the breastplate, his righteousness to live by. But then look at, the third thing, verse 15, talks about our boots. <laughs> I had to call them boots, even though it's called the shoes. But the soldier used to pr protect his feet. You know, those Roman soldiers had, had those leather straps all around their feet, laced up to avoid getting a direct blow to their flesh in battle. And even so, Paul says, as a believer, you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And folks, hey, that simply means that you, as a believer, have by the gospel of Jesus Christ been brought to peace with God. And in fact, then you are able to take that peace with you everywhere you go. So no matter where you go or, or what happens, nothing can harm you or change who you are as the child of God and praise His name. Amen. And so Paul is implying here that it doesn't matter what road you take, 
that you go down, you go there as the redeemed man of God. And so this, the boots here represent, is all about representation. Whereas the, the belt is about readiness and the breastplate is about living from his righteousness, when you put his boots on, you're saying in your mind, I am representing Christ everywhere I go. You see, because people lose battles because they compartmentalize their Christianity. I've got a dear brother in Christ i got a dear brother and friend in Christ who he is, he's awesome on, the front, on certain fronts and in certain places, but there's a couple of places that he goes that only a few people know about where he doesn't go representing. He goes to fail, and he admits it up front. And so as a believer, you don't compartmentalize your life you don't say around the family, I'm going to be this way as a believer. Or at church, I'm going to be this way. Or when I'm with my men's group or my spiritually minded group, I'm this way. But when I am gone, you know, when I'm off in Vegas, we do what everybody in Vegas does. Not that kind of mentality. We are a representative of Christ everywhere we go. And if we understand that in the battle then we won't be unaware of the enemy attacking us at an undisclosed location. You with me? I've got a good friend that drives a bus with me. He was in the Navy. And you know what? Everywhere he goes, as long as he's been out of the, the military a long time, but everywhere he goes, he's still in the prepared military mindset. In fact, you go and sit with a restaurant, at a restaurant with him, and when he was in the Philippines back in the day, when he was in service, they taught him never to put his back to the door because they never knew what was about to walk through the doors, even though they had their guard down. So you're always a representative. You're always prepared. So you got the belt. It's all about readiness. You got the breastplate. It's all about living from his righteousness. You got the boots. It's all about being a representative of him everywhere you go. But then well, I want to talk about the shield of faith. I'm calling it the letter D, the barrier. You remember last week I talked about the soldier? The soldier actually had two, uh, two shields. He had a fighting shield and he had a battlefield shield. The, the fighting shield was something kind of like Captain America has. Don't y'all love the Avengers? I love them. In fact, I, I, in my dreams, I am Captain America. And he's got that little round, you know, shield that he uses when he's fighting. Well, that was the small shield in, that they used when they had the sword in one hand. But when they were marching, that shield was on their back, and they had the shield of faith. Because as they would come into to battles and line up like the old school uh, wars used to be, you know how they used to set the battle in array. And the enemies would face one another. And, and then from the rear, the flaming darts would come and it would be the first wave of attack. And as soon as the arrows came into the front line of, of the warriors, it would get some of them. And it would weaken their fronts. But not the Roman soldier. Because the Roman shoulder, soldier knew that, that sure enough, those arrows were coming. Yeah, that's right. They were ready. And as soon as the, the arrows came, they planted the shield into the dirt, got behind the shield, and it deflected all of the arrows. And then they would come out from behind and take their other shield off and go to war. So there was the, the barrier between them and the enemy's darts. Well, what does the barrier represent? Well, as Paul depicts it, it represents that, as we said last week, when we call to question the loyalty of God, 
The devil shoots a flaming arrow at us, and if we don't have the shield of what? What did he call it? The shield of faith. So the barrier is all about our realization that we can trust him in the battle. He was complete, he's completely aware of the enemy's tactics. Even though in the middle of the battle, the Lord may have led us to a place that looks like the entire army is at jeopardy. And the flanks are, are, are exposed, but yet there's the shield of faith that protects us from all those flaming darts of the evil one. Oh, and so we trust him. We don't doubt our leader. We always have the barrier of faith. I want to tell you, friend, if you're ever questioning God's loyalty to your heart or to the cause of Christ or, or to the church or to your family, you've left your shield behind in the battle. Boy, that's what it's there for. You need that barrier between you and the enemy. And then last, no, excuse me, two more. The Bible and the bridge. I'm going to hurry along here. But in verse 17, he says, put on the helmet of salvation. You say, I don't see the Bible in that. Boy, you better. <laughs> Naturally, the helmet protected the, the head of the shoulder, uh, soldier. rather, and, and, and this is a direct reference to the, to the need of the believer to protect his mind. Oh, the devil's going to hit your mind with all kinds of lies all of the time. He's the master of deception and, and trickery, and he'll fill our head with so many lies that we just can't distinguish between truth and lies. I want to tell you the number one men, the number one problem with men today is not taking enough time to get in this word and know the truth in the midst of the battle. Well, we think we're such he-men that, that we got it. We got it covered. But we've got to stay immersed in the truth because it's the truth that thwarts the lies of the enemy. And we always need to hear the heart of the master. The master plan of the battle, we've always got to be immersed in the, in the Word. And the, the Bible here the, is all about the revelation of God. So stay in it. And then there's the bridge. It connects you from heaven to earth. Paul said praying always. Everybody say always. always. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication. Oh, listen, folks. He ends his admonition by saying that the soldier must always stay in contact with his commander, with his leader. Verse number 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Watch this. Why? That you may be able to what? Stand. You know, there's a saying floating around and I like it. Uh, the saying is, hey, the only way that you're ever going to stand up in battle is if you'll kneel before the leader. And that's absolutely true, folks. So you've got these six elements of, of, of armor. And that last piece, the, the bridge, it's in recognition of the fact that, hey, all of our strength flows from God's hand. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, and, and this is to my shame. There's been times where, where I've entered into ministry or maybe even a service, don't judge, and it's a complete flop. You know what I'm saying? And I come away going, what, what just happened? Why did that not... And then God says, did you ever seek my heart the way you should have? Did you ever? And so guys, ladies, boy, that strength is in prayer. 
Paul said our weapons are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They're mighty, one version says. And so a lot of people fall in this fight because they're using the arsenal that, that they provide. I've seen a lot of youth pastors and young preachers, they're going to forge a plan against hell with their personality and wit and skill base they forge into ministry only about six or seven years later to fall out of it it's because they weren't ready they weren't prayed up they weren't in the word it seems so silly to say those things doesn't it I mean David you would think that as believers we would know to be praying you would think as believers, we would know to, to be in the truth. As believers, that we would know to live from the person of Christ within. And have His power and not our... You would think that we would know that, but for some reason, we, we operate in the power of the flesh a lot of times. And the Lord has to let us run that course. Reminds me of, of the children of Israel of old. You remember when they went up against Jericho? Remember that? And old Joshua, he prayed and he sat before the Lord and the Lord gave him a battle plan. He got direction. And God said, go and take that city. It is yours. And they went and they did exactly what the Lord said. Even though it was crazy, the walls fell and they completely defeated the great city of Jericho. And then just a few days removed, they said, well, let's go over here and take care of AI. Y'all remember that story? We don't need all of our soldiers. Let's just take a few over there. <laughs> and it's never even recorded that Joshua ever prayed. He never sought the face of God. And they rolled into AI. And AI whipped them as if they had never been in a battle before and sent them home packing. You want to know the difference why churches succeed, why people excel in their walk with Christ, why you see ministries take off, do well, I assure you it has nothing to do with the leader, the organization of it, the money that's behind it, no, no, no. The battle is the Lord's. And when people humble themselves before God and repent of their sin and they get in the Word and get the direction from their commander-in-chief and they pray and they seek His face and they live out of the righteousness of Christ, when the church does that kind of thing, then God blesses and does a work that only God can do. What's true of the church is true of the family, men. I've seen a lot of men. Breaks my heart. It really does. It breaks my heart to try to reason with a, a couple as marriage is on the rocks and, and reason with the husband. This is what you need to do. But yet they continue to pursue the path they've been on forever. And it hits the rocks. Shatters the bow of the boat, never to sail again. Listen, folks. Hey, the church, the family, any institution, these are just things on the face of the earth, but they're all fueled by the power of God. And when we're in line with Him doing His work, doing His will, all according to His ways, God's going to win the war. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. That's how you fight like men. You stay in the Word. You stay on your knees. You keep that shield of faith up. You stay ready for the battle. You live from the resources of the righteousness of Christ. And everywhere you go, you don't compartmentalize your life you know that you're a representative of Christ. That's how you fight.